Good morning. As in case you haven't guessed it, Pastor Ron is out of town. He and his uh, wife are getting a weekend, well-deserved weekend away. Uh, it's, I'm glad that he uh, that they're able to do that. Although he might be watching this, I don't know. He'll watch it later if he's not watching it now. Because uh, I'll always find out later. That's why I have to be careful what I say, you know. <laughs> Never know. Huh? <laughs> uh, before I get started, let's, let's have a word of prayer. God and Father, I do thank you for your great love. Father, I thank you that we can come, that we can worship you, that we can lift up your name in all that we say and do. Father, I ask that you would just uh, let your word be spoken today. It's not... Nothing I have to say is important, but everything from your word is incredibly important. And Father, that you would help it just to, to you know, find its way into our hearts. Father, that it would change our hearts, that it would change us for the better to follow you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, um, you know, generosity. You know, it's, there's a lot of different things that, that we should be known for. And I think that Christians, a lot of times, I was listening to... Um, I think it's First Christian Church over in Fort Myers this morning. But he says Christians are known for so many other things, and a lot of times it's not generosity. It's not love. Uh, you know, when people, of course, you know, the, the, the news press, you know, the press doesn't help us, right? I mean, the press camps out on people like Westboro Baptists that are just horrible people. And I hope they hear me say that, because that, they're always out. They're, they'll go protest a funeral. And I'm like, People are grieving. They're going through a horrible, horrible time, and you're out there. It just doesn't make any sense to me. As, as, as believers, how should we be known? Um, Noah was known for his faith, right? <clears throat> he was acting and doing what God said just because God said it. Build a boat. Build a boat. It's like, I've never seen rain before God, but I'm going to build a boat because you said to. You ever thought about that? He's never seen rain, and God said it's going to rain, and it's going to flood, and build a boat. Okay. I mean, just think of all the miracles brought forth in that one, in that one lesson throughout Scripture. I mean, the, he built the boat out of gopher wood that doesn't exist anymore. I don't know if he used all of it, but um, he, he did build a pretty good-sized boat, more like a barge. But you know what? All the animals showed up two by two. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? Maybe not, maybe, maybe not after like two weeks. I mean, I don't know what it smelled like. I'm hoping God did something supernatural and put them all to sleep or made their smell like roses instead of what it normally smells like. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, you go clean out a barn. You know, you ever drive by a, a, a cow pasture? Sometimes you get a little too close. <clears throat> you know what I mean. Joseph. Joseph was a man of integrity. He was acting righteous when no one else was watching. That's the hardest time sometimes for us to be righteous is when no one else is watching. Yet Joseph, you know, he, he ran from Potiphar's wife. He didn't just, run, didn't just walk away. He got away. He ran. And yet while he was stuck in prison, he helped people out. Um, Joseph needed to be, I think, I think God did that to bring him some maturity in his life. though, Because he wasn't a real mature guy, was he? I mean, you think about what he was doing when he was with his brothers. You're going to bow down and worship me. Well, you know, if I went up to my brothers and told them that, they would laugh. You know, I've got, I've got two older brothers. They would both laugh. <clears throat> my sister would laugh uh, even more. She's the oldest. Uh, you know, to whom much is given, much is, you know, much is required. We in this country have been given more probably than anybody. Right? I mean, you, you know, you, you want to, you know, remember when they were talking about, oh, the 99% that have all the money? You realize that the United States is the 99%? We are the 99%. You look at the rest of the world. When Abby and I were in, uh, in India, it's been quite a few years, but you know, the average person there might have made a, a dollar a day. I don't know about you all, but I, couldn't, I don't know what I would do with just a dollar a day. And yet they were surviving and doing well. We have been given much. God expects much from us. Um, I like the, the statement, you know, with great privilege comes great responsibility. From those, to, in Luke twelve forty eight, it says, from those to whom much has been given, much is expected. Folks, we've been given much. We have been given more than, I mean, just, just born in this country, 
I don't care where you're, where you're at as far as your income level, whatever. You're, you're in this country. And chances are you, you could make it, you know, you can, you can do what you want. And God is blessing this country still. So we come to this, I, I want to look at the story of Abram before he was Abraham. Uh, in order to understand Abram's generosity, we need to know a little bit about this man. He was given much. Um, in uh, Genesis 12, uh, it says this, uh, starting at verse 1, it's going to be verses 1 through 3. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you and dishonor those, and those who dishonor you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now we, we read that. And we can look at it historically and know that that is true, right? Abraham was looking at this, and he is looking forward, right? He hasn't seen it happen yet. But when we read it, we can look back and say, all nations are blessed because of Abram. If you, know, if you don't believe that, just look at the children of Israel. God blessed the children of Israel immensely. You know, when, when King David was king, were they not blessed? When, when his son Solomon was king, were they not blessed? Now, when, they, when the king followed God, the nation was blessed. When the king didn't follow God, things fell apart, right? You know, the, the idea of blessing follows obedience. You know, we, we, we want blessing, but we, we don't want obedience. We want to be able to do it. Our country is at a very much at a point where we want to do whatever we want and, you know, I can do whatever I want. I can live my life however I want to, and I still want to be blessed. And God's like, that's not really how this thing works. You can't do whatever you want. You know, we, you know, we, we say we have freedom, and we do, but that freedom, along with that freedom comes responsibility. You know, I had a teacher in high school. He always says, you, you have freedom of speech, but you can't yell fire in a movie theater. Why? Because it's dangerous. You start yelling, and of course, back you know years ago, and probably not so much now. Most movie theaters have, you know, built-in fire extinguishers and all that stuff. But you know what? Back back in one day, man, they had a fire in the theater. It was it was devastating. So yeah, you have freedom of speech, but you can't say whatever you want. Abraham was given much. You know, he says, and imagine him going to his wife, "Hey, hon, God's told me we're going somewhere. I don't know where it is." My wife would say, yeah, you, you, you never stop and ask for directions, right? Any men ever stop and ask for directions? I'm so glad that God invented GPS <laughs> because now I don't have to stop and ask for it. But, you know, I've gotten into places where I'm like, we went with when my girls were younger. We went to this place in called Mason's Gym Mines. This is the kind of place that when we got to it, you're looking around thinking, man, if, if somebody came out and murdered me today, no one would ever find my body. Because this place was in a cove. It was so far off the beaten path, and we followed little yellow signs the whole way out to this place. GPS did not work there. It was a fun place. Oh, my goodness, we got there. It's like, oh, if we get murdered today, I'll never, you'll never find me. But you know what? Abram didn't have GPS. He had God. God said, I want you to do this. He said, I want you to leave. You know, he's going to take his wife with him, but you're going to leave your family. You know, you're going to leave your, your, your immediate family behind. And I'm going to show you where to go. Now, think about this. How old was Abram when this happens? Do you know? 75. Think about that for a minute. When the, the guy that started uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship when God called him to do that, do you know how old he was? He was 62. J. Irwin Overholzer. 62. Some people think, oh, man, my life's almost, you know, I'm whatever age. And, uh, and I, I certainly don't want to be starting something new now. I'm too old to do that. Right? Here Abram is at 75, and God says, okay, I need you to leave your family behind, and I'm going to show you where to go, and just trust me. And he's going to go. He was 75. But he had learned to trust God. Folks, that's something we need to practice. We need to figure out how to make that work. 
of how to trust God and how to rely on him. Because it's not, I don't think it's easy. But you know what, you don't, you don't, um, you don't start out with the hard questions, right? Start out with the easy stuff. God, what, you know, where do you want me to, to go? You know, what, what, who, do you want me to, you know, who do you want me to share Jesus with today? What do you want me to do today? This, this lesson of generosity. He had learned to trust and follow God because God was generous. God is generous. And he was given things from God. And God was teaching him to be generous. And, and Abram learned to be generous as well. Genesis 13, verses 1 through 4. Let me read that to you. It says, So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him uh, into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, gold. And he journeyed on the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where, he, where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called unto the name of the Lord. You know, he went out there to this place and he called out to God. He went out and he worshiped God. He called on the name of the Lord. Listen, when, when you're going through something easy or difficult, how much are you relying on God? How much are we calling out to him? You know, usually we wait until we hit rock bottom and then suddenly it's like, oh God, I need your help. And God's more than happy to help you. But you know, it's much better, wouldn't it be, to, to ask him every day, even when you're going through good times and bad times, to worship God, to lift up his name, and to make him part of what you're doing, not just when things are going bad. And yet a lot of times that's when we talk to God. We wait until things are falling apart, and then we, then we finally call out to God, and God's like, ah, I wish you'd have called me yesterday, because I had a better, I could have kept you out of this. But you waited till today. Now I could help you get out of this, but it would have been better if you had talked to me yesterday. He called on the name of the Lord. He comes to this land. Now he's out there, he's with his, uh, his nephew, Lot. And there's a problem. Abraham's very rich. He's got a lot of livestock. He's got a lot of gold, a lot of silver. We've, we saw that. But he was at a place where the land wouldn't support all of his livestock and all of Lot's livestock. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody comes up to me and says, hey, I've got this house here and this house here, you can have whichever one you want. That's really what God's doing. I've got all this land here, and I've got all this land here. Abram, which do you want? Well, Abram doesn't take it, right? He looks at Lot and says, Lot, why don't you pick the one you want for your livestock, for, your, for, your, uh, for all of your stuff? You go that way, and I'll take what's left over. Now, that's not human nature, right? You know, we want to take what we want. And yet here, Abram is saying, you take the, you, if you want, you take the choicest land. You take the choicest land. I'll take what's left over. How could Abram do that? Because he knew who God was. You know, God blessed him. And he knew that. He knew that God was going to bless him. So the land, you know, there wasn't enough grass for both of them. Animals need to graze. Uh, there wasn't enough water for both of them to stay where they were. There wasn't enough space. And I don't know how much space animals take. You know, I, I drive, we drive by, and, and uh, this game that Jeannie's family always played was they would play this game called cows. So they would count the cows, and whoever had the most cows at the end of a trip somewhere would win. I have no idea where this game came from, but now we always sort of joke about it when we drive. Uh, uh, Alexander likes this game when we drive. We play it with him until he gets to where he thinks he might lose, and he's like, no, I don't want to play that game anymore. He does not like to lose. <sighs> but he wants me on his team, so that always makes me feel good. But you know what? There wasn't enough space for all their stuff. And so he made a generous compromise. You pick the piece of land you want. Listen, Abram was entitled to the piece of land he wanted. You know, he was older. It was, it was his right to have more. So he made a generous compromise. You pick the land you want. He could have chosen the one he wanted, but he was generous. Take the land you want, and I'll take what's left. Look at uh, verses 10 through 11 of Genesis 13. It says, uh, 
And Lot lifted his eyes and saw the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt and the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. So Lot picks the better place. It's well watered. It looks beautiful, like the garden of the Lord. I don't know, I, I sort of wonder if he's referring back to the Garden of Eden. You know, they would have known. You know, they probably would have known. They're a lot closer to it than what we are. You know, the Garden, garden of Eden was about 6,500 years ago. You know, and that's how old the earth is. Don't believe anybody that tells you anything different. We are, this planet is not millions of years old. We were, we look, at what, look at what we've done in the last few hundred years. We would have destroyed it a long time ago, right? We're, you know, but... But no, they, they knew, they would have known what the garden of the Lord looked like. So he looked at it and says, this land here, this is beautiful. This is what I want. You can have the rest. Uh, Lot was not generous, but, but Abram was. So he makes the generous compromise for him. But because of his unselfish generosity, what does God do? Look at verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after a lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look the place where you, at the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward, where for all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. So he, he made the compromise, and God's like, listen, you made a compromise. Man, that is great. I'm going to give you everything else. How often have we seen God do that in Scripture? You know, when, I like the story of Solomon. Solomon is, you know, God's like, I'll give you anything you want. Riches, land, houses, what do you want? And what did Solomon ask for? Give me wisdom so that I can properly lead your people. I don't know about you, but that's not the first thing that comes to my mind. I'd be like, let me win the billion-dollar lottery. Somebody won it, by the way, if, if, if it's not, if it's you, we'll, we'll be expecting to check in the offering. Uh, if it's not you, then, oh, then you can, you know, <laughs> stick, stick with us here. Um, you know, the, somebody won that. Money doesn't fix things, right? We know that. You know, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of evil. Now, I, I would like to have more, wouldn't we all? But you know what? I've got God. What else do I need? What else do I need? Because of his unselfish generosity, God blesses him and gives him all this land that he sees. God also secures blessings for his generations to come. Look at verse 16. It says, I will make you an offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can be counted. It's amazing. You know, when I go see my dad... Uh, the, the, the greatest joy when I look at my dad, my dad's happy when I go see him, but he's really happy when his grandkids go see him. He's really happy when his great-grandkids go see, see him. He loves his great-grandkids. It's just amazing to watch him. You know, they're, they're, he has up days and down days. He's 90 years old. I mean, you're going to have up days and down days. But you know what? I walk in the room, and he's glad I'm there. But when I walked in, walked in with Alexandra Leland a couple weeks ago, or last week, last Sunday, and my dad's face was so much different than when I show up. You know, he wanted to see his great grandkids, and you know what? God is blessed. You know, my dad will be the first to tell you when he looks back. You know, they've got you know out of five kids, sixteen grandkids and twenty-two great grandkids. God is blessed. And he'll be the first to tell you that it wasn't anything they did. It was God. You know, God has blessed and given him all this. You know, when I, when I think of, of my family, my dad's family, and my mom's family, as far as I know, all of them. Now, my dad was the seventh of ten, seventh or eighth of ten kids. He had eighth of ten kids. Every single one of them knows Jesus as their Savior. You know, so I, when I think of heaven, you know, out of my dad's family, four are left. He's got two older brothers and a younger brother that are still still here. 
But, you know, one day we're all going to have a reunion in heaven that's going to be amazing. I look forward to that day because, you know, there's going to be so many people that I want to see when I get to heaven. Probably the, 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 most, the most exciting to see will be Jesus. Amen? But you look forward to seeing him face to face. You know, we've talked about him. We've, we've shared him. We've, we've done all the things. We, but you know what? Someday we're going to get to see him face to face. And Jesus is going to look at us. And, I, you know, he's not going to, I don't know what he's going to do. He might look at me and say, Tom, I could have done so much more. <laughs> but I hope not. I hope he'll say, well done. I don't know what he'll say. But you know, I look forward to that day when I can see Jesus. And so many other people that we get to reunite with in heaven. But you know what? That blessing all started where? It all starts with Abram. It all started way back with Abram. God says, I am going to bless you. And because of you, I'm going to bless the nations. See, the whole point of Israel, when Israel came together as a nation, the whole point was that God was going to bless all nations because of them. He was going to bless everybody and help them all have a better life because of what Israel did. And I think at one point that happened. I think when it was, you know, during King David's reign, during Solomon's reign. But you know what? I, you, you look back and you think, God wanted to bless. And you know how he really blessed us? It's by sending his son through the children of Israel. You know, God told David he would always have a king on the throne. You know who that king is? It's not David, but it's Jesus. Jesus has never given up his throne. He will be seated on that throne for all eternity. And I think that's an amazing thing when you think about that, that Jesus, because of, of Abram's generosity, because of his obedience, here we are years later still talking about this guy. And we're still talking about David and how Jesus came through the line of David. Isn't that amazing? Because of his unselfish generosity. God blessed him and his descendants. Abraham secured blessings through his unselfish generosity. Well, in chapter 14, Lot is taken captive. He's, he's off you know, in a different place. And then we see <coughs> that, that uh, Abram is going to go fight for others. You know, have you ever had to stand up for other people? Now, Lot was not, you know, you can go read about the story of Lot. He was not a, a, an especially good man. I mean, he, he wanted to pitch his tent toward Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was a despicable place, or places. And yet, God, you know, God was able to bless Lot because of Abram, not because of Lot. Lot didn't deserve it. It says that, that Abram is blessed again and that he is going to follow, you know, he's going to follow, uh, he's going to, you know, he's going to go and, and get Lot. He's going to get him, well, win him back. But Abram, it says he fights for the freedom of others. Let's look at verse, um, chapter 14, verses 13 through 16. It says, then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, that was living in the Oaks of Mamre and the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol and of Aner, these were the allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. When he divided his forces by night, he went in uh, with his servants and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and brought back all of his kinsmen, Lot with his possessions, with his women and his people. So he goes and he pursues him, and he brings everything back. He gets it all, and he brings it back because he's going to fight for his kinsmen. He's going to fight for his family. So he fights for the freedom of others. And again, he is blessed for his generosity. Look at verse 18, uh, verses 18 through 20. It says this. It says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed God the most high, and he delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything 
uh, the king of Sodom and to Abram. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons, but take your goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, and I have lifted up my hand to the, to the Lord most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I like Abram's stance. He fights for the freedom of, Saul, of, of Lot, and Lot lets him bring him back, him and all this stuff, everything, all the people that were with him, everything. And then Abram gives a tenth, not of what he earned, but of everything he had to Melchizedek. Now, the New Testament giving principle, a lot of people, you know, I, th I think 10% is a good place to start. If you're giving to your church, 10% is a good place to start. But you know what? The Bible teaches to give how? Hilariously, generously is to the Lord. That's what's taught in Corinthians when Paul says give, give generously. You know, it's going to be different for everybody, but give to, you know, and here Abram gave to the, to the high priest because he recognized he was a man of God. And he gave to him. Abraham again, Abram again is blessed for his generosity. He refuses a, a reward, though, from the king of Sodom. Now, Sodom, you know, if you know anything about Sodom and Gomorrah, they were, it was just a, it wasn't a good place. They talk about a nation, they were doing whatever they thought was right. And, and they were destroyed because of it. They were walking away from, from anything godly whatsoever. But he refuses a reward from them because he recognized that God is the one that rewards him. And so often when we think about what we, what we take, um, you know, I, I don't play the lottery. If you do, don't tell me. Um, I think the lottery is, is very much a, a, a tool of Satan. You know, if you're playing the lottery, put your money in the offering plate. Don't put it, you know. They did a fundraiser um, years ago. The Southern Baptist did a fundraiser. They were trying to raise money for some missions projects. And they raised about seven, 8,000. They needed double that. But they asked people, well, where do you put your money in? And they found out that they, they spent quite a bit more than that eight, 9,000 on the lottery. So if all that money they had wasted on the lottery had been put in for this mission, the mission could have moved forward. Now, if you play it, don't tell me. I really don't want to know. I've, I've, never, I've been given lottery tickets. That's the only way I ever play the lottery is if you hand me one. Um, then I'll play. But I don't, I just, I, years ago I asked a, a preacher, I said, hey, what do you think about the lottery? Should, should Christians be involved in that? He's like, well, it's like any other type of gambling. You know, if you open up your, your life to an area where Satan can attack, be careful. Because then he, he can attack in that, that whole area. You know, and we look at it and think, well, it's just a dollar. Be careful. Um, you know, when I go to, I've been to Vegas, I've been to Atlantic City, and I'll, I'll take 50 bucks and lose it, and then I'm done. Because I know I'm going to lose it. I look at it like playing video games, you know. You go in, you lose your money, and you leave. It takes you about five minutes to lose 50 bucks. <laughs> if you've ever been to Vegas, it doesn't take any time at all. Um, but, you know, we, we need to make sure that we're given to the right things. Uh, the lie that, that giving to the lottery helps our schools. You know, you know what they did. If you, if you followed what happened, there was about $80 million that they took out of the budget, took it completely out, and, and it set it, you know, now the lottery funds that $80 million. So, yeah, they stripped it out of the budget so that our budget looks better. And that was happened, happened 20, 30 years ago. I'm not a fan. You know, Abraham refused a bad reward. He refused the reward from Sodom because he knew that it was God that rewards him. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a despicable king. It wasn't a king that was leading a nation that was doing what was right in their own eyes. Our nation is there, isn't it? Right? Do what you want. You know, do what you want, and it's okay. You know, we want to have sex without responsibility. We call it abortion. You know, we want sex without responsibility. And it's horrible. When you think of all the million, 50, 53 million babies that have been aborted since Roe versus Wade. And how many others have been 
done quietly in other places. We want whatever we want without responsibility for our actions, don't we? And that's where our nation is. Are we, uh, we're not any better than Sodom and Gomorrah. And we saw what God did to them. He completely destroyed them. In fact, you know, you still can't live there. You can't go. You could go there and spend a little bit of time there, but but there's a um, oh I forget what it is, but there's something. There's like a chemical in the air that still to this day you can't live there. You know, we want to do what we want, and we don't want any responsibility. We want to just do it. But you know what? Again, Abram does the right thing. He refuses the reward, and then in verse uh, chapter fifteen, verse one, it says that after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, and a vision says, "Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great." You know, there was a, a different version I read, and it said, "said Abram, I am your reward." I heard a, um, you know, what a messianic Jew is, a, a saved, a, a converted Jew. I heard him preach on this passage, and it was, it was probably it, it, just that verse. It was just amazing because he brought the Hebrew into it in a way I had never heard it before. But that was where I got, I got this teaching that, that the reward isn't something that God's going to give me. It's not a nice house. It's not a nice car. Although I, you know, I, we have those things. But the reward is God. And you know, we look at it and we think, I want God and. And God's like, no, you have me. What else do you need? And we get so distracted by stuff. I was listening to a preacher, and he was talking about how uh, he had had a, they, they had a preacher from China had come in and was teaching. And he looked at them, and he says, I don't know how you Americans do it. He's like, there are so many things to distract you from God. He's like, in China, we don't have these distractions because we can't have them. They're not available. But you know, we in America, we have a lot. You know, we have, you know, most of us have cars that start up every time we get home and take us from point A to point B. You might not have the car you want, but you got a, you got a decent car that gets you where you want to go. I don't know of anybody that's sleeping outside. Right? Everybody's got a house. You know, and we've got nice, nice things. I mean, how many of us have a TV set smaller than 48 inches now? You know, and I sit there and I think about that. It's like I remember, you know, when I was a kid, we had an, an remember Admiral? Admiral TV sets. We had a 25-inch black and white Admiral TV set that, that only had VHF. Now, if you don't know what VHF versus UHF is, it just shows that you're, I'm a lot older than you. But you know, only had so that means we had channels two through thirteen. That's all we had, and it had rabbit ears on top. You had to move the rabbit ears. You know, it's like okay, we're gonna watch channel ten. So you go. So and the remote was Tom go change the channel. That was how it got changed, folks. We've been given much. I think our TV we have now is fifty two inch. And it's like, I, you know, and I never get up to change. I don't even know where I would touch the TV at to change the station. I don't even know where that is. Is there a button that does that? I don't know. I've got a remote. I don't even have to get up. Mr. Leland knows how to do that. He'll turn the TV on for me. Uh, he might not get it to the station I want, but he'll, he likes to play with the remote. We are so distracted. God's like, you have me. You don't need anything. And, you know, some, I, it's some, sometimes I think maybe that's what God needs to do to us. You know, um, the song Heart of Worship, when, you know, when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's a worth that'll bless your heart. You know, God's, God wants, he doesn't want a song. He doesn't want our stuff. He doesn't need your money. He needs you. And you know what? If you come to God and you're truly living and following God, all the other things will come together. All the other things will fall into place. And yet sometimes we get so distracted by all the other things. God is all the reward that we need. So God had some requirements for Abram. 
skip ahead to chapter 16. In Genesis 16, it talks about the covenant. Now, the covenant was given in chapter 12. I'm not going to go through the covenant. But God made a covenant. And if you, if you haven't read Genesis 12, go read it. He, he sacrificed the bulls, split them in half, and God's spirit passes between the bulls through the two halves. God, said, God promised Abraham these, Abram these things. He said, I will make you a great nation. I will give you land. I'm going to give you my blessing. What else do you need? Uh, a great name and a reputation, and all families will be blessed. You know, folks, we're living that today. Because of what Abram did, we are living that. If you don't recognize God's blessing in your life, then you need to, to take a stronger look. Even if your life isn't the life you want it to be, you know, maybe you're struggling financially. Maybe you're struggling with your marriage. Maybe you're, you know, whatever you're struggling with. Take a step back and realize that God has blessed you. Uh, you know, you're in, you're in the, I, what I think is the greatest place to live. You realize that the average house size in the United States is around, what, 12, 1,300 square feet. The average house size in France is like 700 square feet. Where do you want to live? I don't know about you. I couldn't survive. 700 square feet, I don't know. I need my space. No, I don't. We think we need our space. But you know what? God has blessed us. He's given us much. And yet, because of Abram, all families are blessed. They're blessed because Abram was obedient, and, and Jesus came through Abram's line. And because of Jesus, we are blessed. Abram complies, though. He gives to God. He follows God. It says that you know, during the, you know, Abram, served, you know, he followed God. He sacrificed the animals. And it says that terror fell on Abram. But again, God confirms his generosity to Abram. God's like, I'm going to give you all this stuff. If you're just obedient to me, I'll give you all this stuff. And you know what? We, we can look at Abram's life and see that he blew it, right? I mean, how many times did he lie and say that my wife is my sister? His son does the same thing. Isaac does the same thing. You know, folks, God blesses us in spite of us following him. He blesses us because he loves us. He blesses us because he cares about us. And, you know, we sit there and we think, you know, I have to do all this stuff. But you know what? Abram was blessed even though he blew it. I mean, look at King David. Was King David always obedient? Did he always do the right thing? Let's not talk about Bathsheba, right? By the way, when you see David in heaven, I don't think that'd be the first thing I bring up with him. Maybe the second thing. David, what were you thinking? He'd be like, yeah, I know. I was stupid. But you know what? Did God use that? Yeah. God uses all that for us. What about us? Listen, we've been given much. If you're in this country, you have already been blessed more than you realize. And you can pursue a career that you want. You can do, you, know, you can, if you don't make enough money, you can go get a second job. Or you can try to better yourself. You can go to school and, and make some steps to help improve yourself. You can do those things. There are many countries where you can't. You, there are no opportunities to, to progress. We've been given much. The greatest thing we've been given, again, is Jesus. His death on the cross, his burial and resurrection. We've been given that. We've been given a place to live. We have immense freedom, and we have God's grace. You know what grace, you know, we all know what grace is, right? I mean, mercy is, I don't, I'm not going to spend eternity in hell. That's what, that's what I deserve. That's what you deserve. Everyone, that's, that's the best you deserve is eternity in hell. Mercy says, God says, I'm not going to punish you. Not only that, I'm going to give you grace. Grace means all the stuff I've talked about that we get. We get to have a nice house. We get to have nice cars. That's grace. God gives us over and above what we could ever hope for. So we have his grace. We have his mercy. What do we do with these gifts? What we should be doing with these gifts is blessing others. We should be giving to others. We should be blessing through the church. We should be blessing those around us. When people think about you, do they think of you as being generous? And you know, I, as, I, as I was preparing this, I'm thinking, 
do people think of me that way? Do they think of me as being generous? Do they think of me as, as reaching out to help others? You know, we bless others because of what we have. But again, there's, there's a progression throughout Scripture. God's going to give us much, and then he's going to test us. You know, I'm convinced the reason I'm not a multimillionaire is God's like, Tom, you would be controlled. You would be controlled by your money. I don't know if that's true or not. I'd like to find out. <laughs> but so far, God hasn't given me millions. What he has given me is a lot of other things, though, that I consider greater blessings. You know, I love my family. You know, what, what more could I want? I look at my dad and I think, man, I was blessed. And blessed. You know, when I when I go see my dad, it's just you know it, it's he's not the he's not the strong man he was. I mean, my dad's the same height as I am, and I'm around two hundred twenty pounds. My dad has lost so much weight; he's down to one hundred and forty. If I were at one hundred forty, you guys would be like, "Tommy, you need to get to a doctor." My dad has lost so much weight, but you know what? I've been blessed. You know, my parents always had us in church. I, you know, as much as my, my mom liked to yell. Did anybody have a mother that liked to yell? Uh, nobody else admits to it. My mom's in heaven, so she can't get me for saying that. But, uh, but you know what? I never doubted that she loved me. I never doubted that. I knew that she loved me. I knew that she cared. And with each of, it, with each of my brothers and sister. I knew that mom loved us. You know, they took care of us. They, they fed us and clothed us and gave us a, a nice home to live in. You know, those are the blessings that we, you know, and, and generous. You know, my, my dad worked hard his whole life. He's been retired for 25 years. He retired when he was 65. And you know what? God is blessed. And so often, you know, we, you know that, I, I like that old hymn, Count Your Blessings. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Listen, when you're feeling down, when you're feeling discouraged or depressed, list what God has done. God has done much for us. You know, just the fact that you live in this country ought to be enough. But you know what? Most everybody's, you know, I look in the parking lot. I don't see any broken down cars. Everybody's got, you know, how, how many of you have, does anybody have a car without air conditioning? That would be about the greatest hardship I could think of, especially in the middle of summer. You know, everybody seems to have cars that have air conditioning. You know, you got things that may or may not work. It, it might not look like you want it to look, but you know what? God is blessing us. God is generous, and that ought to be enough. That ought to be enough for each of us. So I want you to think about that this week. Now, you know, I love our pastor. Don't you love Pastor Ron? Does it bother anybody that we've had to cut his salary? Really make that a matter of prayer. Because the money's just not there this year. And that was his suggestion. It wasn't ours. But you know what? The, the finances of our church are tight. And I, you know what? I, I think a lot of people's finances are tight. I mean, come on. Gas went from under $2 a gallon to hit almost 5 a gallon. Now it's back down some. But you know what? That's a hardship. How many of you got your last electric bill? Our, ours went up about 80 bucks. Electric bills went way up. You know, and you can look and you can try to figure out why and blame who you want to blame. But you know what? Everything has gone up. It's, it's, been, it's going to be a rough, you know, it's a, it's a rough year. We need to make it a matter of prayer, though. God is going to bless. God is generous. God loves us. And you know what? I'm glad that, that Ron and Rachel could get away. They need a break. You know, I've, I've been in that place where you just, you know, you never feel like you can walk away. You've got to always be. And even when you walk away, I mean, this is a 24-7 job. It never stops. I guarantee you call him today, even though he's out of town. He's going to pick up and, and answer the phone, and he's going to do what you need. Because that's who he is. But 
you know, for us, how are you doing at generosity? How are you doing at, at taking care of those around you? When people think of you, what do they see? Do they see someone that is generous? Do they see someone that loves Jesus with all their heart? Or do they see someone that's screaming and hollering, you filthy sinner? You know, it's not my job to convict of sin. There's a, there's a guy that does that job, and it's not me. And, you know, as a believer, I've had to work at that. Because it's easier for me to point out when somebody is wrong. But you know what? You know, if, someone is, if someone's a follower of Christ, that's the Holy Spirit's job, right? And I've prayed many times. It's like, Holy Spirit, do, do what you say you're going to do. And turn him, you know, try to turn him loose in people's lives. Not that I need to do that. He does what he's going to do anyway. But you know what? God is generous. He loves us. And we need to make sure that we're doing the same. Amen? We need to make sure that we are generous, that we are following Christ, that we are doing all the things we should. Now, I told Ron I was going to preach for three hours, so if he didn't listen to this right away, tell him it was. He said if I preached for three hours, that would make his, his 45-minute sermon seem short, so that made him happy. Uh, no, I'm not going to preach for three hours. But, you know, uh, when you see him, just let him make sure you make him feel good about being gone. He needed a break, and I understand that. We all need a break. I can take a break from my job whenever I need to. I get plenty of vacation time. And, you know, when I walk away from my job, I don't think about it for one minute. You know? But, you know, when you're a pastor, it's impossible to do that. It's impossible. You always are thinking about what's, what's next. So just make sure you make him feel welcome. Or not welcome, but, but that, you know, he was, you were glad he could take a break. So let's pray. God and Father, I thank you for your great generosity to us, for your great love for us. Father, I ask that you would uh, remind us of that throughout the week. Father, when we look at the life of Abram, we see how you just worked through him and that you blessed others. Father, I ask that you would just help us to live that same type of life, that we would lift up your name in all that we do. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.